everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Nature Connects Us webinar series. We are super delighted to have you all here with us today on this windy, windy November day. Uh, we have a very special guest with us today and we're going to share with you all a very successful achievement here in the uh, Nature Conservancy of Oklahoma history. And that is reaching 1 million acres burned in Osage County. My name is Katie Hawk and I will be your host today. Our special guest joining us is the one and only Mr. Burn Bob Hamilton. Bob has been the director at the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve for over 12 years. However, his career with the Nature Conservancy began long before that. When he was fresh out of grad school uh, as an intern in 1982, he started with the Nature Conservancy at the Ordway Prairie Preserve in South Dakota. From there, he began uh, full time with the Nature Conservancy as the preserve manager at Cross Ranch Preserve out in North Dakota. So he hit both the Dakota states before coming to Oklahoma in 1988. And there he worked for our program statewide um, as our director of stewardship um, for and for, for, for a few years. And then in 1991, Bob started full time at the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve, also known as the Joseph H. Williams Tallgrass Prairie Preserve in Pawhuska, Oklahoma. However, he's, his career had didn't stop there. Um, he went on to become the director of the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve in 2008. And he has served in that role for 12 years since. Um, he also serves for the Nature Conservancy as the fire manager for Oklahoma and Kansas for both of those programs. He's involved in our, our regional conservation planning and outreach um, as well. And in 1985, he became our burn boss. And since then, he has served as our burn boss on over 700 prescribed burns and more than 740,000 acres. So he's got quite a bit of fire under his belt. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe that's what makes him so spunky. I'm not sure, but he is definitely a live one and a lot of fun to have on these webinars with us. And we're really grateful to have him today. Before I turn it over to Bob, just a quick update on how we handle these. Um, he's gonna talk with us for about 15 minutes. And then we will open this up to a live Q&A session where you will have an opportunity to ask Bob questions um, that you have. And the way that we will do that is if you will take just a moment and look at the interface down on around your Zoom screen, maybe around the bottom, you should find a button that says Q&A. There might be a button that has three dots and if you click it, it might be underneath that too. So once you find the Q&A button, that's what you're going to click. And that is where you will enter your questions. What we will do is we will answer the questions that have the most votes. So even if you don't ask a question, it might be in your bet your interest to open up the Q&A button so that you can see all the questions asked. And there you can vote for your favorite ones. So the questions with the most votes are the ones we will address. We always have a hard time being able to answer all the questions on these webinars just due to the amount of time that we have. Um, and so to keep uh, everybody's schedules on track, uh, we, we ch definitely try to stay on these no longer than one hour. But um, we also certainly try to answer all the questions that we can. So without further ado, let's turn it over to the star of our show, Burn Bob Hamilton, are you there? Hang on one second, we're gonna unmute Bob. Houston, How's that? Yes, sir, there you are. There Hi, you Bob. go, there you go, okay. Hello, folks. Uh, I was hoping Katie would lead with a, a, a spirited rendition of Oklahoma, the song, you know, when the wind comes sweeping down the plain, because uh, that's what we've got today. That's the reason I'm uh, sheltering inside my vehicle here rather than being outside is we have conditions, quite extreme fire conditions right now. So uh, gusting to 40, it's going to be a little bit more than that here uh, this afternoon, it looks like. Uh, you know, temperatures in the mid 70s, humidities down in the 20 percentile or so. So we are under extreme fire conditions today. Uh, we actually have a little, there's a, there were several wildfires in the neighborhood yesterday when, when conditions were much more modest. Uh, but uh, one in particular, uh, you'll see me looking over my shoulder to see if I, I see a big poof of smoke to the south, but uh, about two miles south of the preserve, right on the north edge of Pasca, there's a little fire burning, a little wildfire that's in some dense cross timbers, you know, these upland uh, native oak plant communities, <clears throat> very hard to put out. 
you got to get in there with a lot of hand tools and stuff. You can't get big machines in there, of course. And so that thing is still percolating along. But when I was looking at it this morning, the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs fire crew pulled in and the Pawhuska Fire Department. And so good luck, fellas. Uh, but we are hoping that does not flare up because uh, under these kind of conditions and the wind direction, uh, it could be literally at our doorstep in minutes. So. Um, we are, we are living in a highly flammable neighborhood as, as uh, I guess is quite obvious. And um, we think of fire, the conservancy kind of looks at this as sort of good fire, bad fire, as sort of that dichotomy. Uh, bad fire being fires that might happen today, kind of these extreme wildfires, loss of property, uh, injury or, or fatalities for humans, livestock, things like that. Uh, nobody wants that, that kind of event. Um, and so that's part of what we, uh, I guess that's part of what we contribute to the neighborhood is the control of those kind of events. So we are a rural, one of many uh, ranch-based rural fire departments up here in, in Osage County. <clears throat> so all of the big ranchers around us have the same sort of equipment setups and it's, it's really a community effort to control fire, uh, but also to manage fire in terms of good fire. And uh, one of the really cool things, what makes, I think this, uh, the Osage, or the Osage Hills, as we call it, kind of the southern end of the Flint Hills. You know, in Oklahoma, we call it the Osage or the Osage Hills. But this last big chunk of intact tall grass prairie, uh, one of the primary reasons it is still prairie now, you know, over a century after settlement, is because fire never left. And so the use of controlled fire or prescribed fire, as we call it, uh, it never left this landscape. It's one, this is one of the few places you can say that in North America. And so Native Americans, of course, were using fire uh, for their different cultural reasons. And that tradition got passed to the early settlers, to the ranchers in this neighborhood, in this part of the world. And like I say, fire never left. And so the woody species never had a, an opportunity to, to aggressively invade this landscape. So kind of that continued use of fire, that fire culture, as we think of it, um, we are privileged to be a part of that. And uh, that's a big part of what we're trying to contribute, I think, uh, to the neighborhood is, is trying to maintain that fire culture or good fire as we think of it. So fire, of course, has, has many beneficial uses in terms of maintaining uh, the ecosystem itself, especially in this Eastern part of the Great Plains where we have relatively high rainfall in this tall grass prairie zone. It's, an, it's ecological warfare out there. So the woody species are constantly trying to invade the prairie, uh, native species for the most part, um, hackberries, elms, but specifically, I guess most intensely would be Eastern red cedar. And so a consequence or a symptom that you see because of our fire suppression over the last century, many parts of the Great Plains, we are battling significant invasions of our grasslands, of our native grasslands by woody species. And what we've done is altered that fire regime. So without fire, like I say, especially in this Eastern part of the Great Plains, uh, I would say easily within one or two human generations, uh, the prairie turns from prairie to forest. <clears throat> and, if, and if you're in the conservation business like the Nature Conservancy, uh, that's not a good thing. You know, what we're trying to maintain is the biological diversity that comes with this uh, incredible landscape. So to allow it to convert to some other uh, vegetation type, we would lose things, well, for instance, like many of our grassland nesting birds like greater prairie chickens. So uh, they are prairie chickens. They gotta live on the prairie. They don't, they don't really like trees. Um, so we are part of kind of that, that whole, uh, effort to try to maintain good fire, productive fire, as I think of it, uh, under prescribed type conditions. Uh, this landscape, just a brief thumbnail sketch, of course, this, uh, this landscape evolved with fire. If you, if you jump in your little time machine and go back 13, 14,000 years ago, where I'm sitting right now would not be a prairie at that moment in time. It was more similar to what Northern Canada is now, kind of a boreal forest, uh, jack pine, fir, um, really not dominated by grasses. And so what happened was at the peak of the last glaciation about 14,000 years ago, that was the situation here. Um, the tremendous impact of that ice just to the north of us is what created that ecosystem at that time. But as the glaciers receded, as Native Americans came to this continent and started using fire, uh, that's what opened up and created these grasslands. And of course, in combination with, with grazing pressure, 
principally by bison, but other native mammals, of course. And so kind of that whole, uh, we, we think of this as really an anthropogenic landscape, if you wanna use the technical terms. In other words, a human derived, a human developed landscape over those eons. And so that's what we've inherited from, from native peoples. And if we wanna, again, if we wanna maintain that biological diversity, we need to put the land back under those forces of nature that originally created and maintained it. And so that's why we use a lot of fire here on the preserve. And we try to use fire in ways that we think approximates that original seasonality and frequency of fire um, under prescribed conditions. And then we, the other significant thing we're trying to do is, is reconnect what we think was historically that very strong interaction between grazing and fire. Pyric herbivory is a term that's been coined. In other words, you know, fire and grazing working together. And uh, the point has been made, especially by our, our research partners at Oklahoma State University, uh, Sam Fullendorf and that crowd, that um, really it's, it's probably improper historically to try to separate grazing from fire, that those two ecological forces were so highly connected. And really that the interplay or that interaction between grazing and fire we think is what maintained the heterogeneity or the diversity out there, the patch diversity, the landscape diversity <clears throat> on the landscape through time, uh, shifting landscape patch mosaic. Ooh, I like that. That's, that sounds really intelligent, doesn't it? <laughs> but the idea is it's kind of this crazy quilt, the shifting uh, series of patches on the landscape through the years, through the seasons, creating all these different habitat opportunities, different amounts of biomass, different species, uh, you know, coming and going because of that, the fire grazing impact. Uh, the general idea is to create and maintain a very diverse set of habitat opportunities to maintain that complete array of biological diversity that we have out here on the prairie. And so that's what we're really trying to do. Um, what else should I be touching on here, Katie? Um, we've had a, a very successful fire program, I think, for a, for a number of reasons. Um, one, I'd say the principal reason is I've already touched on is kind of this fire culture that was already here. And so again, we're trying to, to, to be a productive part of that, working with our neighbors. There's this tremendous history of neighbor helping neighbor when it comes to managing fire. Uh, when I say fire culture, that means, you know, people are comfortable with the fire. They recognize the value of fire, of prescribed fire. Um, they, am, you know, they're, they're comfortable using it. Um, they know its limits. Um, they know how to, to carefully manage that. And so the, the culture is, I mean, that's just a tremendous part of what keeps fire on this landscape. We, we are also benefited by a fairly low regulatory environment. Um, for those of you in Oklahoma, um, you might remember a few years ago, the Oklahoma legislature actually passed the Right to Burn Act, which codified in state regulations, um, you know, making sure that the, uh, the recognition was out there that private landowners and land managers have the right to burn their property for agricultural and, and conservation purposes. And so uh, that's a huge thing. So we're blessed here that really we don't have much of a uh, permitting type system. And so um, under Oklahoma law, you know, as long as you're careful with fire, you're, you're allowed to use fire in this part of the state anyway. As in some of the Eastern counties, it's a little bit different uh, where the Oklahoma Forest Service has more of a regulatory role, but, but not out here. Um, we've been blessed at the tall grass also by having good institutional, good and, and consistent institutional support as I would think of it. So the Nature Conservancy recognizes the value of fire. We have a fire training system within the organization. Um, we actually switched to the federal uh, certification and training uh, hierarchy, uh, I guess a little over 10 years ago now. So all of our crew undergo the same training and standards and task booking and all that kind of stuff that federal agencies use to, to manage their fire programs. And so uh, we bought into that system, like I say, over a decade ago. And I think that, that helped our professionalism uh, in terms of how we use fire. Um, but we've, we've had constant and, and significant support. I mean, running our fire program, you know, it's, it's hard to separate all that, but we probably spend a third of our time in a given year managing fire, either prescribed fire or helping control wildfires, maintaining the equipment, the training, all that kind of stuff. So it's a significant part of our, 
of our land management expense out here. And I would say, I mean, last but not least, the reason we've had success is, is our incredibly capable crew. So uh, of our five full-time staff, counting myself, we have, uh, I need to tease that apart a little better, but I, I'm pretty sure at least a, a century of fire experience uh, between all those staff put together. So these are the guys, these are the folks that, that design, build, and maintain the fire equipment. Um, they, they know how to how to manage a fire. It's, it's kind of interesting now we've, we've worked together for so long that when we're actually conducting a burn, there's relatively little dialogue. You know, we use um, business band radios to, to uh, communicate with each other. But uh, once we get going, everybody knows the plan. Um, people just kind of know their jobs. And so it's, it's a very efficient uh, run and gun sort of uh, program that we have going. So uh, I give a lot of credit to our guys and they just, they literally, uh, you know, you got to really watch each other's backs because things can happen. And I guess at this point, um, Katie, you wanted the little demonstration of some of our fire equipment? Heck yeah. And also, will you tell us a little bit about where you are and um, the, the history of the, the, the specific place that you're at on the preserve? Yeah, I'm sitting here about two miles, I guess, west of headquarters. Um, I'm on the edge of a burn patch. I'll move my phone here a little bit, uh, but I'm sitting on the edge of a burn that we conducted back, I think it was September 21st. So kind of a late growing season burn. And you'll see that that's had a little bit of green up. Um, when we when we kick the bison back out here, oh man, this is, this is the kind of stuff they'll be looking for. You'll see the, the boundary between the burned and unburned vegetation. And of course, the unburned stuff at this time of the year has really cured down or senesced. So the, the above ground vegetation is basically dormant at this period. You know, those plants are still alive, of course, underground. But the above ground biomass is, is pretty low quality, continuing to decrease in quality as you, as you work through the winter, especially if we get uh, significant rainfall. The, the grazing value of that vegetation continues to leach out. And so these, these late growing season burn patches where you have a little bit of green up out there, woo, that, that's like chocolate, you know, out there on the prairie. So Ooh. all kinds of grazing, grazing animals really go for it. So hey, I'm sitting on, oops, sorry, yeah, go so ahead. I'm sitting, yeah, I was gonna say, I'm sitting on the edge here and our trucks we have, uh, as, as the guys are coming by, I'll, I'll give a little narrative of what you're looking at equipment wise. Uh, but what they'll, they'll be doing is kind of spraying along the edge of the patch is kind of a demonstration of, of how that technology works. We, uh, of course, with the conditions we've got today, we can't really stage a live fire demonstration. That, that would be bad for my career. <laughs> yeah, we don't want that by any means. And right quick, before you step out into the um, Oklahoma uh, prairie wind. Um, on the screen, our viewers are looking at a, uh, a during burn and a two months after view that our buddy Ryan West took pictures of. Um, and I believe you've seen these pictures before. It was from uh, some burns this past spring. And so um, just, I didn't know if you wanted to kind of touch on that specifically what they might be looking at. And I don't know if you can yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, Katie. Yeah. yeah, it's really striking. I mean, um, during the growing season, when you conduct these fires, and of course, you know, it blackens that patch, but typically you know, if, if you have adequate soil moisture and some pretty good heat, you know, if the, if the soil is warmed, uh, wow, it's amazing how quickly that springs back. Uh, sometimes within days, you'll start seeing the green re-emerging. And of course, if you're a grazer, um, it's all about access to the highest forage quality. Uh, you can, you know, you, that the opportunity presents itself. So you get these nice lush green patches on the landscape. Wow, that's where the bison come. Uh, cattle, of course, respond the same way. It's a global phenomenon. Um, if you wanna find the highest densities of kangaroos in Australia, go to a fresh burn patch. Uh, same thing in Africa, of course, with all those different grazing animals. And if you wanna find the highest density of grasshoppers, uh, here in this prairie, you go to a fresh burn patch. They are a grazer also. So they're looking for forage quality. So burn it and they will come is how I think of it. Uh, it's again, it's like ice cream out there on the landscape. So um, this whole grazing fire interaction or this pyric herbivory, uh, the idea again is to recouple those two forces of nature. And when 
as I just explained, when you when you burn a patch, boy, that becomes highly attractive. That regrowth is so attractive to grazing animals. Uh, that's where they go. And so within our bison unit out here, the bison have a little under 25,000 acres is what they are free to slop around on. Uh, no internal fences within that. And and we move them, I think of it as we move them with their attraction to, to fire, that fire grazing interaction, rather than using infrastructure like fences. So we've pulled out about 60 miles of internal fence to create this one big unit. And we move them, I think of it as a multi-year, you know, seasonal, multi-year rotational type program, but but we move them with their attraction to fire and those the the resulting high quality vegetation rather than forcing the movement with fences. And so we, we've restored this heterogeneity or this landscape variability out here, and it continues to change through time, of course, as we create new burn patches. And, you know, this patch that I'm sitting in now, it kind of depends on the selection program in the future, but it may not burn again for two, three, four, five years. And so, yeah, it will be attractive, especially this coming summer, but then you know, next year and the following year, there's always new stuff out there on the landscape. It's kind of a continuous smorgasbord we're presenting uh, to the bison and they of course respond to that. And so it's this, again, this shifting landscape patch mosaic idea. And the 200 and some scientific publications that have come off the preserve over the last almost 30 years indicate that that seems to be working pretty well for our goals, for our goals as the Nature Conservancy to preserve biological diversity. So um, we think we've, we, we've gone quite a distance in re trying to restore this functional tall grass prairie ecosystem. Fantastic. Well, we're eager to see it and to see the demonstration that you guys have set up for us. Okay, I'll see if I can rally a little bit, a little bit of help here. Hey, Kevin. Go ahead. Let's splash a little water. Okay, kids. So um, we'll try to step outside here in the blizzard. Hang on tight, buddy. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try to flip my phone around. military unit that we purchased a few years ago. Uh, Kevin we lost it, Bob. I believe he said that Kevin Shoto was driving that front vehicle, y'all. It is. We can we can hear you just a tad, Bob. Wow. The second unit is the Woo! Was that windy or what? <laughs> Man. <laughs> okay, so. Breezy out there. 
It was. Can you give our viewers a recap? So we had a hard time hearing as you were narrating as they drove by. Can you just give us a recap of truck one, two, three, and four? You bet, you bet. Yeah, so the first unit was our Hemet. So it's a uh, surplus military unit, uh, eight wheel drive, if you notice, but kind of a very long chassis. It kind of looks like the uh, Oscar Mayer Wiener Mobile. <laughs> yeah, my first thought was like a centipede. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, it's power. It, it's, uh, of course, all these things are big diesel trucks. But um, what's really cool about it is it carries the water tank on the back is about 2,800 gallons. And so it carries a lot of, a lot of, a lot of ammunition, essentially. And uh, all these trucks are built to where we've got double nozzles on the front where we can, we can have a cone type nozzle. Uh, everything is run from the cab. So kind of robo nozzles is the short hand version of it. So the one, one guy runs the whole rig. So Kevin Shoto is driving the, the, uh, the Hemet there. And so within the cab, he's got some joysticks and he can control the, the angle and the pitch of the nozzles and the spray pattern all within the cab and the rate of flow and which, um, which nozzle he's using and all that kind of stuff. So it, uh, back in the old days, we used to put a gunner. Uh, we would get these large military trucks, two and a half ton trucks and stuff. And we would put a gun, we build a platform on the front and you had to have a second guy on the front then actually operating the spray gun. So this is more efficient, much safer, nobody exposed on the front where they're gonna get thrown off or burned up. And so everybody is, you know, just one, one guy, one machine, you're in, the, in your cab, protected that way from the heat and the smoke and, and using that, that higher technology. The second rig, the green rig was the Oshkosh. So that's our newest machine. We bought it just a few years ago. It carries about 1600 gallons of water. Uh, the cool thing about it, it articulates in the middle. <clears throat> so it's, uh, it, it bends the, the front two axles also move as you, as you move the steering wheel. Uh, but if for large turns, the whole rig bends in the middle. So it's kind of like an articulating tractor if you're familiar with those. <clears throat> and that unit was, was driven by Gene Big Soldier. So he's our newest guy, just, he's just a couple years into it. He's kind of our rookie. And then the third unit uh, in the back was uh, Perry Collins driving a five ton military truck that I think has a 1600 gallon uh, tank on it. So it, the tendency has been through the years, um, our equipment has evolved uh, just like everything else. And so that the trend has been bigger and bigger. Bigger is better, you know? We have a well-watered landscape out here. We have a lot of uh, livestock, man-made livestock ponds, um, about 130 on the preserve. Usually at any given moment, you're within, typically within a half mile, usually not further than one mile from a surface water source like that. And then of course there's the major streams and things like that. <clears throat> so all these trucks are built to where they have two big trash pumps on the back. And so you can pull up to the pond, you throw your hose in, fire those engines up and within usually five to 10 minutes, you're full, you're ready to go back into the fight. And so we use a lot of water because we have a lot of water and we feel like we need that capability in our trucks, uh, those high capacity pumps and those, those high volume nozzles to be able to control, uh, especially in our dense grassland fuels out here, uh, you need a fair amount of water. You just can't be spitting at it. And so it's the technology has kind of evolved through the years and I would say one thing that's really uh, cool about the neighborhood is there's kind of this competitive, this healthy competitive <laughs> uh, sort of spirit, this esprit de corps, as I guess I would say, among the, the, these rural-based rancher fire departments, um, you know, who's got the next best idea? And so there's been tremendous evolution in all this stuff in the last uh, several decades. And, uh, you know, now when we have a big wildfire, you call the neighbors and you'll have a dozen big military trucks show up of all these different sizes, different colors. It looks like a parade, uh, but everybody has these, uh, all these big ranches have these high capacity military grade trucks that work real well on this kind of landscape and, and this setting. Fabulous. So Bob, our folks, um, our viewers are looking at a screen right now with some historical um, burn photos um, showing some of the older equipment. I'm not, can you see that on your phone screen? Yeah, yeah, I okay. can. So can you tell us what we're looking at? Yeah, the one on the left, the white truck, uh, that was a two-ton truck. 
Uh, that was our first attempt to kind of go big. It was a four wheel drive, but, but basically a farm truck just had a big flatbed on the back. Uh, we put a thousand gallon poly tank on it, kind of a low profile tank. And again, you can kind of see we built the platform on the front. So you have the, the main suppression or the main, you know, how you're delivering the water is with a guy standing on that front platform, you know, firing that, that gun. Um, so that, that was, you know, that was a step up over a, a, a cattle sprayer, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, the image in the upper right is a uh, um, one of again one of our early spray rigs where we we just bolted a, a spray unit onto a trailer and pulled it with a with a farm tractor, and again then you had to have a, a separate guy, you know, out there actually delivering the water with the spray gun. Um, the lower right is an image of uh, ATV. So we use machines a lot. So we are a highly mechanized fire program. Uh, typically we're just burning with five or six people or on our crew, if we're burning with the neighbors, then of course it's, it's a few more than that. Um, but, you know, a good fire, what I, I jokingly say, a good fire is when your feet never touch the ground. You know, you're, you're either driving your big military truck or you're driving a, a UTV or an ATV. And we use, we use machines a lot to compensate for the, relative lack of manpower and and we need again that that kind of overwhelming power of especially our spray trucks uh, but we use atvs a lot for setting the fire for for actually igniting the edge uh, for patrolling the edge uh, i should have mentioned so the very last rig that came by was tony brown in the utv uh, with a little sprayer on the back and so we use those a lot for patrolling that edge uh, kicking turds <laughs> If the good Lord could invent a cow or a bison that didn't poop, that, that would be nice. Um, that, the, the burning fecal material, um, to act more professional about it, that's a major mop-up responsibility. So along that burn edge, uh, those fecal pats, those, those turds will sure burn under uh, conditions where they can dry down enough, especially on a day like today. And of course, they, they are like a slow burning fuse. And so you can come by the first time, second time, third time uh, with a spray truck and actually blast those things with water. <clears throat> but if you don't actually physically remove them, kick them into the black, um, if they have any fire left on them, you know, an hour or two later, if they are in contact with unburned vegetation, then away it goes. So uh, you really have to pay a lot of attention. You know, mop up is a very important uh, kind of that last cleanup operation to make sure that edge is secure. Wow. Interesting. You learn something new every day when you hang out with Bison Bob, folks. <laughs> what a great informative um, session. Thank you so much, Bob. You know, everyone, you we've, learned, we've learned a lot here hanging out. And I think our viewers do have a lot of questions, but clearly we've learned that uh, what was the year you started the burn program here in Oklahoma, Bob, at Tallgrass, 1980. We, we started burning on a pretty big scale in 1993. 93. Uh, I think in 91, we were doing some, you know, fire break type stuff around the facilities. Okay. But, but in terms of ecological burns, that really started in 93. Fabulous. So we've learned that, that Bob and his team there at the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve in Pawhuska, they've burned over a million acres since 1993. And that is not just on our property, but that's also in conjunction with neighboring landowners. We've learned about good fire versus bad fire. Uh, we've learned about our partnership with OSU, uh, Oklahoma State University, and our patch, the patch burn model, and how the patchiness helps with biodiversity. Very interesting. We've learned why is this program so successful, um, specifically about the landscape and how it's culturally accepted, um, historically and, and modern day. Um, and then also about the low regulatory settings in that area. They have the institutional support that they need. They have the crew. They have a long-term history of uh, our knowledge base with their team, as well as financial support from our program. Um, and then also it's a, it's a management team that's very professionally run. Uh, and they have lots of big toys to go with it, which is just really mm. cool. Yeah, thanks for the show and tell. <laughs> we are now going to switch into our Q&A mode. I would encourage everyone to click that Q&A button. Even if you do not have a question, take a look at them. We're gonna start asking uh, the questions with the most votes. So the current time is 1236. We have until 1 p.m. We're gonna start off with the top question, which is from our friend, Ryan West. Ryan is asking, hey, Bob, how do all the little critters like the prairie mole crickets deal with fire? Oh yeah, good question, Ryan. Um, 
Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, fire is part of the evolutionary history of this landscape. So you would expect that the native species that are out here have learned, they've, they've you know, adapted to that phenomenon over the eons. And so um, there frankly is some, depending on the time of year, so you can cause mortality of, of above ground uh, animals in particular um, that, are, that are caught in the fire. But many of those species, small mammals, reptiles, um, it, of course, animals that can fly, fly away. Uh, but many animals will try to go underground. The fire passes relatively quickly. And the, some of the research I've seen that the, the heat really does not penetrate farther than about one or two centimeters on, on average. So as the fire moves across and flashes across, very little of the heat penetrates down. It significantly penetrates down into the soil. So anything that can go underground is relatively safe. Um, and I guess the way I look at it too, that there is, like I say, there is some collateral damage with some species that are caught in that. But the bigger objective, again, is to maintain the overall habitat quality. So uh, if we were to exclude fire, again, if we were to exclude fire from this landscape because we didn't want to, to burn the occasional snake uh, or something like that, then it would, eventually it would not be quality habitat for that animal. It would turn into a woodland. So. Um, so yeah, I would say uh, most of these, these, well, these native species have seen fire for a long time and they figured out how to, how to live with it. All right, fantastic. Thank you for sharing, Bob. All right, our next, we got some great questions in here. Our next one, oh, whoa, they're moving around. You guys are voting left and right, good stuff. All right, Carmen Reven, Revenja, if I'm saying that correctly, Carmen, I hope I didn't butcher your last name there, um, is asking if it is a human created, this is a good one, Bob, are you ready? Are you ready Ooh. for this one? All right, it's curveball. Yeah. All right, Carmen's got it, here we go. <laughs> if it is a human created landscape, as you mentioned earlier, I'm just saying that I'm ad-libbing a little bit here, why not yeah. let it go back to whatever nature would go to? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good one. And that's, um, I think that's good, uh, good beer talk, you know? So you crack open a beer, get comfortable, you <laughs> gotta get philosophical about these things. But um, I would say there's been this evolution in conservation over the last decades. Uh, back when I first started with the organization, back in the old days, uh, the conventional approach for conservation was humans were the problem. If we could exclude humans, uh, and their impacts, let nature take its course, all would be fine. Well, that's, yeah, that, that's a soft, warm, fuzzy, but uh, that's, that's not acknowledging the role that, that humans played. It, it kind of depends philosophically on how you see the role of humans in nature. Are we completely foreign to nature or are we part of it? And I would argue, geez, we evolved with the world like everything else. Uh, so we're part of the landscape. And again, for us to, um, to try to maintain the native species that have been out here for the last 10,000 years, uh, for us to turn our back on that and just let nature take its course, remove grazing, remove fire, this, this becomes a woodland fairly quickly. And so if your concern is things like grassland nesting birds, they're gone. Um, so, uh, I guess the responsibility is upon us to determine what we think are our conservation objectives and what we're trying to do, what the Nature Conservancy is trying to do is maintain this biological diversity that we've inherited that's been out here for, the, for thousands of years. All right, thank you for the beer yeah. talk. Uh, beer Carmen talk. says, send beer. She texts in, to send beer, please. <laughs> Carmen, thank you Cheers. so much for that wonderful question. <laughs> and Bob, thank you for getting philosophical with yeah. you. That was fun. Yeah. All right, Susie Paddock is up next. And Susie is asking, where are the bison during the burn, Bob? During the burn, yeah, it's, it's interesting. They, um, you, you get a lot of free wisdom, you know, when, you, when you're in the land management business. So I remember back in, the, back in the days when we first started burning and we first brought bison out here and several folks approached us saying, oh, geez, you guys better watch out because as soon as them buffalo smell that smoke, they're gonna run to Montana. I was like, oh, gee, really? <clears throat> that we really haven't seen that. So I think the, the bison are pretty confident. They're they're pretty confident in their physical abilities. They're very mobile animal, of course. And so typically what we see if we're doing a burn, um, typically what we use is, is a surround type ignition, meaning that first you start on the downwind side. Uh, 
kind of hard to explain without graphics or whatever, but you start on the downwind side, start the backfire along whatever fire break you create or, or is already there. Um, let the fire back into itself. Then you then you work up the flanks up the sides where the, where the, the wind is kind of blowing parallel with with the direction you're going with the fire. And at that point, say if you're burning 500 acres, so uh, a lot of times what we'll see is we'll get you get two thirds of the way around the unit before you light the head fire. Um, a lot of times, yeah, there might still be bison in there. The only time we worry about that, the only time we go in there and try to push them out is if we know there's, for instance, an injured animal in there, an animal that's been hit by a car or something, it has a limited mobility, or if there's some really fresh young calves, uh, something like that, then we'll go in there, we'll hold up, we don't like the head fire, we'll stop, and we'll go in there and, and push those animals out. But that's pretty rare. Um, the vast majority of the time, we, we feel pretty confident we can just light that head fire. Those animals get up and they move off. They, they go to that, the backfire side, they hop over that fire, they're really not too intimidated by it. Uh, again, like I say, they're, they're pretty confident of their abilities. And, and I think they probably have some message deep in their psyche that, hey, this is, this is fire. We've seen this before as a species. Yeah, no big deal. How about that? Good to know. I, I actually yeah. was looking for a video that you sent me once upon a time that shows the bison and exactly what you just described. So I will continue looking for it as we go through the Q&A. Yeah. And if I do find it, y'all, I'm going to bring it up on the screen while Bob continues to talk just for the sake of efficiency. Yeah. So if you see a video pop up with fire and, and, and bison, um, it's in reference to giving a visual for his, his, question, his answer um, to that recently uh, asked question that we were just received. So thank you so much, Bob. Appreciate that. All right. Our next one is from Gemma Warswick, Warswick or Gemma Warswick. Help me out there. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, the question here is, uh, how many private landowners do you work with to maintain an effective fire strategy across the tall grass prairie habitat? And Bob, of course, my first thought might even be that that might be in hectares, and you might even consider that from Oklahoma and Kansas since the tall grass prairie ecosystem spreads beyond our Ooh, hectares. Yeah, I would say locally here. Um, right, acres. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, kind of around the preserve. I would, you know, the preserve is roughly forty thousand acres. And I would say we are engaged with um, landowners an additional probably 60,000 acres around us that, that we are engaged with those other private landowners or um, you know, the, the state of Oklahoma owns the Western Wall Game Management Area. We share about a six mile boundary with the state on our east side. Uh, so that's the wildlife management area. And of course they use fire. So we, we work with them. Um, but I'd say in total, probably about 60,000. So, so roughly about 100,000 acres is what we're involved with in terms of fire management uh, in this part of Os Osage County. And when, we, when we're burning with our neighbors, what that means is, again, kind of this fire culture. Um, we coordinate those activities, the timing, what, you know, the, the actual area we're going to burn, the spatial area of it. We develop the maps and all that kind of stuff. And... Um, and it's a highly coordinated activity. So, you know, they contribute people and equipment. We do likewise. And so a lot of times, yeah, if they want to burn, we want to burn, you know, right there next to each other. We just make one big unit out of it. And so it's a, it's a very cooperative neighbor helping neighbor sort of approach. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Bob. And that approach is utilized throughout the Nature Conservancy's program. Um, fire management program, not just here in Oklahoma and Kansas, of course, um, utilized in other states and places, I assume. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. All right, very good. All right, Clark Phipps has the next hot question. After, and by, by the way, you all are now seeing that video. If you, if you got to see that, it was just up on the screen. You can see bison coexisting with the fire. I'm gonna play it one more time. All right, so Clark is asking, hey, Bob, after a burn in an altered landscape, is it necessary to reseed the native species? Ooh, that's a good one. Shoot, no. It, yeah, this is, uh, uh, we, we have a lot of blessings here. Uh, but one of the major ones is we, we still have a native plant community here. So this prairie has never been plowed. Uh, I would say the two big reasons we still have prairie in native tall grass prairie, in the Osage Hills, in the Flint Hills, two big reasons. First of all, was, was the, the fire culture that I mentioned. You know, fire never left. And so the woody species have been held at bay 
through the use of controlled fire, prescribed fire. Um, the other big reason we don't have, uh, we still have prairie here, is because of the geological armor, as I think of it. So a lot of times when you burn off this country, it's amazing the amount of rock that's at the surface. And so this, this Flint Hills, Osage Hills landscape for the most part. Now, the major stream valleys can be plowed, but most of the uplands really you cannot plow them with, with conventional you know, tillage tools. So Mr. John Deere's clever little invention really couldn't do much good in this part of the world. <clears throat> and so this was maintained as native rangelands. And so this native prairie, again, uh, it has evolved with fire and the native species, the warm season grasses, principally this is driven by warm season grasses, but also the, the wildflower species are adapted to fire. And so, no, you don't have to do any overseeding. You really don't want to. Um, just, just allow those native species to come back. So uh, again, they, they have adapted with fire. And so it's, it's all part of that, that natural disturbance recovery system. Fabulous. So I've heard yeah. people mention a seed bank before. Is that seed bank under the so in the soil? Yeah. So that can be significant, especially for uh, annual plants. Most of what we are dealing with out here, in in terms of uh, the dominant plant community, is is perennial vegetation. So the warm season grasses, the big blue stem, little blue stem, switchgrass, Indian grass, those native grasses are perennial. In other words, they they, they never die. So it's, um, yeah, you can burn off the top, but the, the living tissue, the meristematic tissue, really where it, where it grows new leaf structures is below the ground. And so it's adapted to fire. And so, um, you know, obviously, I mean, I don't know if you saw it too well on this burn patch, but that, that nice green stuff coming up from our September burn, that's, that's the regrowth on those warm season grasses principally. And so those are perennial species. Uh, there are some species that, that are like broomweed and things like that, that are also native, that are annual species. In other words, they, they only persist by producing seed that then it grows next year, produces another seed crop like that. They are not perennial. So they, they depend on that, that seed supply. But for the most part, the perennial species, they, they persist from the root mass that's out there. All right, good to know. So that, that green stuff coming up, AKA green chocolate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. All right, our next question that is the hot one at the moment is from Carol Popish Putnam. And Carol is asking, can you tell us, Bob, how is a controlled burn done? That's a big one. Yeah, it'd be nice to demonstrate today, but that, yeah, might be a little bit too crazy. Um, like I say, usually it's that surround type ignition process. Um, so usually you're starting with a backfire. So for instance, if, if the downwind side of your unit that you wanna burn has a county road or an oil field road or a major stream, um, that's where you like to backfire. So you kind of use fire to control fire is the idea. Um, and the most vulnerable stretch is, is kind of the downwind side. So think of it as, you know, where would fire run in terms of the wind direction? So you start on that extreme downwind edge of the unit. Uh, what we do a lot of here is that since we have such great firepower with our spray, spray, spray equipment, uh, we do a lot of wet lining, as we call it, where we can just use those big nozzles on those big machines to drive across the prairie from point A to point B. You create a wet line or uh, basically a, a temporary fire break by just spraying water into the vegetation and then those big tires on those machines pack down that or squish that vegetation down and then the next truck runs over it again saturates it again and so you end up with a 20 30 foot swath of wet grass you light the fire right at the edge of that wet stuff then usually you have one or two rigs come along behind to reinforce that edge um, but again, you start on that downwind side, let the fire back into itself, back into the wind. Um, that's fairly controllable. And then once you have that line secure, then you start working up the flanks or the sides. And again, usually that means you're, you're lighting kind of in parallel to the wind direction. And then the last piece, so <clears throat> when we have media out here, you know, everybody wants to see the head fire. That's the exciting part. When you light the fire and it gets to run with the wind, that's when you get those 20, 30 foot flames. Oh my God, you know, it's just that 
you know, that wild and crazy sort of look. Uh, that's the head fire. Uh, that's the easy part. I, I think of doing a prescribed burn is a lot like paint, painting your house. You know, the hard part is all that scraping and scratching, filling the hole, priming and all that stuff. When you finally get around to where you're getting to put the top coat on, wow, it looks like you're doing something, you know, but the hard work is all the other stuff. And so prescribed fire is kind of that way. The hard part is the back fire, the flank fires, the head fire. That usually takes relatively little time because whoosh, you're just running across there and the fire is running with the wind and then you're just knocking down that edge. So it's, it's kind of these separate pieces of the puzzle, really. Awesome. Well, very good analogy. Bob is always full of awesome analogies, y'all, which would just add to that beer <laughs> session with Carmen. I'm telling you, we can talk, uh, uh, you know, we can, we can get into the, the theory of everything as well as some really awesome analogies with Bob. I love it. Um, and so Carol, and for anyone else interested as a landowner to do burns on your property, please note that right at the very end of this session, which we're getting close to wrapping up, we will have um, some resources for landowners interesting in burning on their property as, as far as where you can go learn more and how to, how to get more information. All right, we're going to try and answer at least one more right quick. We've got seven minutes left. Um, Clark has another popular hot question and that is, Bob, what season is best for prescribed burns? Depends on your objectives. Don't you love those kind of answers? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So um, dormant season burns. So again, in kind of this, the vegetation type that we have here, which is dominated by these warm season grasses, meaning that they really reach their peak in terms of their, their growth late in the growing season. Um, these big blue stem, little blue stem, switchgrass, any grass. Uh, if you're trying to benefit those species, uh, which typically that's what the what ranchers are targeted in on because you know that's that's the vegetation that provides most of the forage for your for your livestock. Um, dormant season burns are the way to go. Dormant season being you know when when the prairie is not actively growing or or it's at the very end or very beginning of the growing season. So around here in, in this Flint Hills landscape, Osage Hills, most of the burning that's done at least in the past has been dormant season uh, spring burns. So meaning right before spring burn, spring growth starts. So around here, usually March um, into April is the primary spring burn season. And so the, the objective there is to remove that thatch, remove that dead grass that's out there. Um, the soil then warms faster in the springtime and you actually get earlier green up by, by exposing the surface of the soil. And of course you just blackened it. So it absorbs even more uh, solar radiation. It used to be thought that the, the ash deposition from a burn kind of created or, or provided a fertilization type effect. Uh, because a lot of times uh, you'll actually see increased production. The prairie will be more productive uh, with a burn at that time of the year. And so again, the, the thought was, well, maybe it's the fertilization from the ash. Uh, but I think Kansas State University up there at Kansa Prairie uh, has pretty well showed that, well, no, that, that's not really it. What's going on is by, again, exposing the soil sooner in the season, uh, by allowing it to warm faster, you kind of kickstart the microbial activity in the soil. You start the nitrogen cycle. All those microbes that are involved in the nitrogen cycle, making nitrogen available to the grasses, that starts earlier. So you, you kind of ramp it up. And that's what gives you then that you're actually fertilizing the prairie, but, it, but it's, it's because of the microbial activity in the soil, not something you sprinkle on the surface. Uh, but the result is you typically you will get uh, more production with a, with a spring burn like that. What we're finding is that in terms of other objectives, uh, growing season burns, kind of late summer burns appear to be the most effective for controlling woody vegetation, especially uh, encroaching shrub species. Here on the preserve, kind of the most significant, uh, and again, these are native species, but the most significant uh, woody encroachment problems we're having, we think are challenges, are from some of the native plum species, dogwoods, uh, sumac, uh, species like that, that they, they grow into these, or they, they turn into these ever-growing clones. It's probably all, say you get a, a patch of brush that's maybe 40, 50 feet across, that's probably all one individual, all tied together through the root system. And what, what appears to be the most effective in controlling 
those brush species are these late growing season burns where you can really get in there and, and top kill those and set them back. And so again, it's kind of depends on your objectives. We, we uh, being the nature conservancy and trying to uh, approximate how the original system worked, we burn in all different seasons, all those seasons, because we know from historical accounts, the prairie was burning year round. And so again, if you're trying to provide the maximum amount of habitat opportunities for, for native plants and animals, uh, you need to simulate that original disturbance regime. So we're burning all different seasons. Uh, and again, allowing this shifting patch mosaic effect to, to wash over the landscape. Fabulous. Okay. So much information, Bob. That was totally stellar. Absolutely epic. And we are going to stop there with the questions. We still have several left, but for the sake of time, we are going to stop there. However, I am going to uh, jump down and it's not because her name is Katie and my name is Katie, but Katie Homer asked a question and I'm going to show a video to answer it. And uh, Bob, I think you're going to know what video I talk about just as soon as I ask the question. But um, uh, this is this will answer Katie's question. Her question is, does the large equipment ever get stuck during a burn? Well, Katie, <laughs> let me show you the answer to your question. Here we go, folks. Oh. fun <laughs> oh yeah you, you all happen. saw that right <laughs> <laughs> great question katie yeah. thank you for asking that because it's always an entertaining video to watch <laughs> yeah I, I should maybe add katie so yeah as our equipment has gotten bigger our our jerk ropes have gotten bigger so um we actually get these these really nice big jerk straps um that have you know like a hundred thousand pound capability to them so yeah, it's uh, you can anything can get stuck, and when you get these big machines stuck, it's a oh crap moment. Um, and we've actually had moments where we've had on burns where first truck gets stuck, second truck gets stuck trying to get the first truck out, third truck gets stuck, to, you know, oh my that goodness. kind of thing. And so you end up with a whole chain effect, and and of course, typically the fire is still burning at that point, and so it you have these. Pucker, pucker situations, right? <laughs> Where thing, things get a little puckery. Yeah. Another analogy oh from Bob. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my, what shall we do? Yeah. <laughs> well, Bob, we cannot thank you enough for sharing your time today and for your team, for Perry and Tony and Gene and Kevin to come out and share and show off the, the equipment that we have. We appreciate everybody for joining us. So right quick, stay on with us, everyone. I've got a couple more things for you, especially if you're interested in more fire information. But Bob, thanks again. And big thank you to your team. We sure appreciate you. you and bet, you uh, thank you so much. Yeah. All right, folks. So if you are interested in getting land, fire on your land or you know someone who is, um, you have resources. Um, there are county conservation districts that have been organized and have resources just for you for this specific reason. If you go to okconservation.org slash districts, there you will find, you can find out who, what your local district is, and they, you'll see that they may have some uh, events, some workshops, they have landowner programs, they have grants, they have financial and technical assistance programs just for this. So you may not know a lick about fire, but you can contact them and find out how you can get fire on your landscape. Also, um, there are prescribed burn associations. Again, you may not know how to burn, but you might have an association in your neck of the prairie or woods, wherever you are at. Uh, you can go to ok-pba.org and there you can find who your local prescribed burn association is and or if you have one. There is not one for all counties. Um, and if you are interested in starting one, there is a form on the ok-pba.org website where you can submit your interest in getting a prescribed burn association organized in your area. They also pro provide 
activities such as workshops um, and prescribed burn associations. What's so valuable about them is it is a network of other landowners in your community who are burning and they will get together and help each other burn their properties. So you're not doing it alone. It's a really cool thing. All right, uh, last but not least, we know the COVID is spiking. It's going wild right now. Um, kind of like this wildfire out at Tallgrass. Hopefully that gets under control and hopefully so does COVID. Until then, um, playing it safe is always a good idea. And if you're still wanting to get that nature experience, uh, we do have a virtual opportunity for you available, nature.org slash OK360. That is our virtual field trips. Uh, 360, a 360 degree view of various uh, uh, views at Tallgrass Prairie Preserve, as well as our other preserves throughout the state. So um, nature.org slash OK360, you can go on virtual field trips. It's a lot of fun with the kiddos um, and with the fam. And uh, so that's everything that we have for you today. And we're so grateful for you all to join us. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you again. Uh, we are currently planning our December webinar. So if you don't mind, give us just a couple more days and we will get that information cranked out to the public and hope that you will join us for that one as well. Um, thank you everyone. Stay, stay warm, stay healthy, and uh, we'll We'll see you next time on our next Nature Connects Us webinar. Thank you, everybody.